Hello everyone. Today is June 15, 2022. And we will talk today to great artist uh, Michele Bayona from Mexico City. We will talk a little bit about his, um, uh, his history uh, a little bit later today. Uh, I want to introduce um, Again, if whoever uh, missed that uh, um, uh, program about our new colors and watercolor uh, line, and so it, we, we had 12 different uh, colors, new colors, and uh, they all in pants. And we will again talk a little bit later about why they're in pants. Uh, for special uh, left three weeks of June, we will have 20% discount on all our travel sets where you can choose any uh, watercolors you like to try and uh, so uh, this is just special for this um, uh, for this session and uh, i want uh, let's go back to michele so michele was born 1971 in vicenza italy and um, so but now he lives and teaches in uh, mexico city he specifically teaches watercolors and when i saw first time his work i just i was forever in love and so uh, that's why, why our story with michele started uh, a couple years ago and um, so george had the um, interview with uh, michele a couple months ago we were preparing that that um, session something happened and so um, the session all together 44 minutes unfortunately we can't do this 44 minutes today so we butchered that interview to 24 minutes and so please stay with us but at 11 o'clock pacific time uh, online will be a um, whole video whole version of this video please uh, check it uh, michele is just absolutely great artist and so his notes about watercolors are just great so um right like always we will show you video first please ask the questions on the right side of the screen and uh, right after 24 minutes, uh, Michele will be with me and uh, George. I'm sorry, my name is Tatiana Zaitseva in Natural Pigments. <laughs> and I'm assisted by George O'Hanlon, like always. He's behind the camera. And so uh, we will interview uh, Michele. Continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michele, and for uh, joining us on this episode of the Artist Materials Advisor. And uh, we're going to be talking about watercolor today. And um, I want to get some of your impressions uh, about uh, the Rublev watercolors, but in general, uh, your process about watercolors, because I find that uh, I enjoyed your looking at your work. And now I get to you know meet you. Uh, virtually at this point in time, but hopefully meet you in person at some point. So thank you. Thank you, George. It's actually a pleasure to meet you. You know, the, this myth, myth of George, uh, who knows everything about, <laughs> or a lot about uh, painting best practices in a way, you know, yeah. the way we should be working with our materials and also the way we can work better. Uh, so. Definitely, I embraced you know uh, Rublev watercolors, uh, which is basically natural pigment, mm -hmm, right. and also some other products you have because I'm also interested in drawing and I also do oil painting. So, you know, definitely, I, I'm proud to be somehow part of the Rublev family because there is something going on, you know, in, in your small production and mm -hmm. creating products that are. They are basically made with love. So, you know, I'm all about love. Tell me, uh, so how did you, you mentioned that, of course, you do you do oil painting and watercolor. Um, and I've, uh, I've gotten at least the impression that your main thrust now is more about watercolor. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm uh, uh, misunderstanding that. But uh, can you tell me, well, 
uh, if that is correct, and why did you choose or get into watercolor mostly at this point in time? Yeah, no, it is correct. It's my, it's my technique by election, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean I, I, don't, I don't do other, I don't experiment with other techniques. And actually, recently I've been drawing a lot and watercolor has been part of my process of producing a drawing. Studying the classics, uh, you know, the old masters, I realized they do use a lot of washes and even, even to create the base of their drawings, there is a lot of watercolor involved or in. And I did find in watercolor, since I was very young, like the perfect technique because I'm sort of, I tend to control a lot and watercolor doesn't let me. So, you know, it does to a certain degree. And so I love that because for me, those, it has always been something uh, therapeutic in a way. So I do love to create art, but watercolor makes it better somehow mm -hmm. because of the spontaneous, sp well, it is spontaneous and it gives something that other techniques uh, probably don't, which is the, the, this element of surprise, you know, this natural element can disrupt something you've done when water really plays with you and you play with water. There is something very special that happens at that point, both for the painting, which is our main focus, but also for yourself, because you are involved into a meditative and a playful game, which, which makes it fun. It's never the same. You can't repeat watercolor. And, you know, you might be able to repeat some drawings and oil paintings, but a watercolor is pure gesture and expression, mm -hmm. even if you're doing it like me, with a lot of reference to the classics and old masters, it is still something unique that, uh, well, I think, you know, it's just pure magic. Talking about uh, the Rublev watercolors, uh, now that you've been working with them for, for some t a little bit of time now, uh, do you find them different from possibly other watercolors you've used? And, and I also want to talk to you about, you know, I know you're making your own watercolors too, which is, I, I, which is fantastic, and I want to talk about that too. So what do you find differently? Well, there, there's two things. Um, I mean, you can buy really good watercolors, uh, but the fact that you... The, the, the reason why I do like the Rublev is, it, is that there, I, can, I like to work with many, you know, with many colors, but I try to keep the, my palette really limited. Mm -hmm. And I always loved, you know, to work with grounds, like with the iron oxides, uh, you know, materials that are natural and come from the ground. And, mm -hmm. and I, Rublev has a you know, this amazing selection. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful names, by the way. Ambrogio Yellow Earth. That's, that's a great name. Um, I like to work with the two, and, you know, Rublev comes with tubes that are uh, like 15 millimeters. I used to find this, you know, when I was younger, but not anymore. Now, if you want to buy a professional watercolor, it will be five millimeters, right? <laughs> it's insane. I don't like that. Also, I like the way uh, the pigment concentration in the tube is respected. And, you know, um, there's just the binder and the pigment, which uh, I love. And I love also all the products that are related to it. Uh, I can make my own paint as you, as you said before uh, i have my grinder i have my kit uh, which also comes with a wonderful video on how to make your own paint and add pigments you know by your gener generous uh supporting me with a lot lots of different pigments you know this is a very expensive pigment and uh, to be able to create your own colors i think there are very few companies that do both. Uh, 
create products and also the final product, and, but also gives you the tools for you to make your own. You also uh, create, you know, a watercolor medium. You know, you give a lot of freedom to an artist in order to expand and experiment, and uh, it's just easy. You know, it makes it really easy to find everything in the right place. Uh, when I when I do draw, I like to prepare the surface, so I don't make the drawing. I I don't know if I can show you. Can I show? Maybe it's, I'm going against the rules. But this, oh, okay. for example. It's, it's a drawing that has been done with a uh, watercolor by Rublev um, as a base. And then working with chalks, um, you can sort of build up the form, the volume. Uh, and I also used some washes in it. So it's not that just my watercolors, I'm glad you like them, uh, but you know, I use watercolors even when I need to transfer something on a camera or on a panel for an oil painting, I do use watercolor as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I find it like as one of the most uh, versatile and flexible techniques that are out there. Besides, <laughs> you don't throw away any pigment. You basically always have the possibility to reuse, you know, this looks like a mess, right? But but you don't have to clean your palette mm -hmm. because you can always use the pigment that is left over. Mm -hmm. There's no problem in it throwing away paint. Uh, every, every single pigment is reused. When I work with watercolors, I like to use the white of the paper. Therefore, I don't prepare it beforehand. Uh, although sometimes I do work wet on wet from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So I might just extend some water on top of the paper, but um, mostly I do it later, like a, like a wash. Like a, if if the watercolor lost its uh, consistency throughout, which means if I don't have a general tone to the watercolor and I want to get a strong atmospheric effect in the final painting. Mm -hmm. I might actually apply a layer, a thin layer of paint on top of a finished watercolor. Mm -hmm. It takes time and you need to experiment with something you might want to mess up, mess around with, you know, but, but it can be done and it has saved a lot of my works, you know, some works that didn't have a convincing background. Uh, I was convinced that watercolors would be, you know, something very ephemeral. You do it and then what's done, it's done, and then you just leave it there. But recently I've been sort of finding ways to keep working on watercolors for days. And uh, definitely you need a good support for that. Uh, have you ever used uh, white uh, watercolor or gouache in any of your work? Very little, but I'm, I love it, you know, very little, but I love it, mm -hmm. especially, especially for when you paint landscapes mm -hmm. and you work with a certain, certain transparent backgrounds, you might want to use some gouache for the foreground. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have in mind this beautiful lake, small lake painted by Zorn. Uh, where you have actually on the water some more opaque paint, mm -hmm. definitely with the addition of white wash. I would use white wash more than white watercolor mm -hmm. because it's more efficient in a way. But um, I don't just, I don't want to use it to cover up something. I just want to use it because it's a tool to create transparencies and more opaque layers. Mm -hmm. Just for that. I don't use it for correction because you can totally correct a watercolor and you can actually almost get to the white of the paper if you want it to. Mm -hmm. You know, this myth that watercolor can be undone, it's a myth. Um, if you have been working with watercolor for quite some time as I did, um, you just need the right brush. 
-hmm. You definitely need the right brush to erase uh, properly. But painting is a process of applying material and also it, it is, in fact, a, a process of taking some material off. Mm -hmm. This works in oil paintings, this works in watercolors, uh, definitely works in drawing. So why does it, you know, why is it like accepted that we erase in uh, drawing and not in watercolor, right? Mm -hmm. So we can do really fine, interesting details in watercolor by removing pigment. Also watercolor, I find really beautiful because you can move pigment around using the medium of water. So when you have this little film of water on your paper, you are able to create incredible things, you know, different effects uh, by just moving the pigment around. Mm -hmm. That's, I find, really, I find watercolor really uh, novel in that sense, uh, more than chromatically in terms of uh, the brush strokes, the effects that you can leave on, on the paper, and also that every single trace is there on the paper itself. So mm -hmm. it's a really honest, uh, completely true process. For me, watercolor is uh, John Singer Sargent. You know, for me, watercolor is uh, Andrew Wyatt. For me, it's definitely what well, actually Andrew White did use it in a dry way. But um, it is important to be able to have all the tools to create what we want. So there is no limitation as mm -hmm. long as you learn. And uh, the learning process allows you to paint anything you want. Um, so what I like about using watercolor wet on wood over wet uh, is that it definitely transmits uh, feelings at a deeper level. When I work dry over dry, it's just for, you know, fine details. Uh, I do that, but it's just for, it's just for texture and it's just in very particular occasions. Uh, I, I really like to use wet over, over wet, uh, and that, and I do think that uh, it is sort of it is sort of what watercolor wants to do, you know. And the name itself says, you know, that water has to be involved, and it, you know, the more water is involved in the process, the better the watercolor uh, result. Because the watercolor being so transparent. Um, if you look at a watercolor, you see the entire story of that painting. If you look at an oil painting, it depends who did it, um, right? Uh, some story of that painting might need to be looked at with x-rays. Mm -hmm. In a watercolor, you see every single mark. Mm -hmm. And um, this is definitely how we should be painting uh, in, in a watercolor. Uh, technique. And I'm starting to learn also how to mix colors in a way that it's really interesting to me mm -hmm. uh, because somehow a lot of people that use watercolors, they tend to just take it out of the tube or just go to that particular pan and get the, the color straight from there onto the paper. Right? Mm -hmm. But it is fascinating how how mixing the watercolors, we can reach an incredible amount of different colors of, in our palette, in our palette, mm -hmm. or in a southern, which is 10 colors, can become so much bigger. And, you know, a lot of people look for space, you know, to mix their colors when they paint with oil, but they don't when they paint with watercolor, they're just like there with the little pan trying to get the little tree and the mm. little piece of paper. Watercolor, when you paint big, it's amazing. That's why I use tubes. Um, you know, when the watercolor comes straight from the tube, it's it's creamy. Uh, I like I like how Rublev 
really respect, you know, the, the colors. So some colors come out from the tube differently than mm -hmm. others. This is um, a testimony that they are authentic and there is no other, uh, how do you call, fillers in mm -hmm. them. Um, and so when you deal with colors and when you start mixing colors in watercolor, you, you, you'll be surprised because the pigments uh, do have a love-hate relationship much more uh, evident in watercolor than with other techniques. Mm -hmm. In watercolor, when they dissolve in the medium of water, they're, you know, they're just, because when in the binder, they're like sort of crystallized into the binder. But when they are free to go, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. A lot of watercolors will talk about granulation. Is that a factor that you use in your painting? Well, some some artists really tend to look um, into those, you know, and use those colors that that, that can give them the effect they want. Um, so granulation in portraits, uh, which is what I do mostly, mm -hmm. can be can be important for background maybe some textures uh, uh, that you might want to be experimenting with, uh, but not really to represent the skin tones or those, those part of, of the anatomy. I do a lot of figure, figure and watercolor as well. Um, I do love the effect, but I find it more useful when I do landscapes and especially architecture. Mm -hmm. I do find it very useful when you do uh, a street view, um, or maybe paintings of dust, um, which is really what we try to do, right, George? I think what we do as painters is to create emotions. And mm -hmm. uh, if if I were an abstract painter, I would definitely play with granulation a lot more. And I like the fact that there is some sort of abstraction in every watercolor. Uh, even more so than drawings or, or, or oil painting or, or, you know, other techniques. Because really when you paint with watercolors, the, wa the water itself is creating this abstraction. Mm -hmm. And if you are a realist painter or you're going through all, through all the process of creating volumes and through these volumes represent reality the way that Renaissance has basically told us to do. Um, in watercolor, this is, it becomes really an interesting thing because you are doing a, a painting with a certain dose of realism and then the technique itself adds that, that abstraction, uh, mm -hmm. which is basically what we do in every technique. You know, we decompose reality to build it again on a bidimensional uh, surface, but with watercolor, that that goes to a different level because you can really you don't have to worry too much. You know, with with more water, you create an effect that you weren't even. Are there any other uh, observations that you've made about, let's say, what the different pigments in watercolors? Because of course, um, each pigment will will have a different behavior. You know, some notice. Uh, maybe a blossoming effect where the walk, where the pigment spreads out into the water more so perhaps than other pigments. True. Not just that, uh, but uh, also there is, there is a combination that works and other combinations when you mix your colors that don't. Mm -hmm. And so we, and color theory has been taught in many different techniques, but in watercolor, there are very few teachers and or artists that are involved into that very much, you know? So I've been doing some research and uh, my palette is, which is actually available on your page is, is definitely, actually that's sort of a limited version of it. It is that has definitely a lot to do with how the pigment reacts with the other. When, when we paint a portrait, we need to, uh, achieve two different goals. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is to create a good work of art. The second one is uh, we 
want to give soul to this work of art. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of portraits are missing the point. They don't capture the the essence of the person we are trying to portray. So I would say it is not just a matter of technique, but it is definitely a matter of understanding what we want to do with a portrait and mm -hmm. how we relate to the person that uh, is there in front of you. I highly recommend to do portraits from life um, because when we work with pictures, we just don't, uh, it's impossible to capture the personality of, of, of a subject. Mm -hmm. And also, um, there is too much information in the photograph in, in, in the in the photograph. It's too much information, and that is going to go into the painting somehow, mm -hmm. ruining the painting. <clears throat> and the information we want is not in the picture. Mm -hmm. So definitely work from life. I always do that. Um, uh, with COVID, it's been a little bit more difficult, but I've been working on some pictures, and in some of my work, you can see, you know, some famous actors, because I like to catch, you know, some some stills from movies, um, which I find really interesting because it's an imaging movement. So I can see the three dimensions mm -hmm. of a face. It's, it, this is really important. So uh, for, for the technique itself, I would recommend for watercolor to start with something else, maybe stay in the figurative um, figure in watercolor it's beautiful and it's fast and uh, it's so much fun you're in front of a model and you can actually get most of the gesture in the first three minutes uh, it's pretty amazing um, mm -hmm. something that uh, graphite you're very frustrated when you have short poses because you don't get to it mm -hmm. um, with watercolor you're already rendering you're already creating tonal values immediately. So it's really, it's really good for figurative. Uh, and when you, when you step up to portraiture in watercolor, um, George, I think it's the most difficult thing you can do in, in painting, uh, mm -hmm. in art, uh, is to do a portrait in watercolor. Mm -hmm. That's why I teach that. Mm -hmm. Because I think a good teacher can really help uh, getting to a good level almost right away. And then it's a lot of practice because portraiture, it's, it's really the most difficult thing to do. <laughs> Michele, we uh, definitely butchered that video because I know you, you were so excited during that video. And, uh, you know, I, I think I uh, studied or even like remember every your word because uh, while George was working on your video and cutting from this 40 minutes, it was a very difficult job to do. <laughs> so, I know. So, but again, uh, I remind you 11 o'clock, we will have full links of the, uh, of this video online. And so then it'll you be can... on YouTube on, on the same YouTube, YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah. So I just can't uh, tell you my love to you, Mikael, so, Michele, so because yes, I, I know it's once I saw this, it's like, and it's always like, you, I watch your videos, you making portraits, it's like, it's very easy. <laughs> Although you say that it's the most difficult thing to do. Well, I'm glad I make it, I make it look easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And now, watercolor is not, yeah, watercolor is not easy, but uh, we have to enjoy the process. And so we are the ones who, who make it difficult, uh, really, you know, and um, I guess if you let yourself go and you don't worry about the final result, you are more likely to get a good final result. Yeah. So what we realize with this interviews with uh, uh, with artists, it make uh, makes our actually life much easier because you know I can show you so many uh, colors and uh, you know explain to you how we make it and so for what purpose and then suddenly artist come comes and so then everything uh, have different life and so that's why with your uh, with your 
way to express like like i can tell you this ambrosia nobody knew what it is so once in a while people buy the pigments but uh basically the watercolor was almost forgiven for i mean forgotten for probably like for five years nobody knew once in a while people like what nice nice uh name so let let me try after when you started and looks like your students started to use it and so then suddenly it's become a thing now so ambrosia is <laughs> well it's a wonderful name actually who who i, I bet george put that name on, right or was it you no it's no, actually it's, it's actually because the uh the deposits are are near that area in uh, in northern italy oh wow so what we try to do Perfect. with the, with the, so uh, you know most companies have like um, uh, either, fancy fancy names how I call they're, that they're either fanciful names or they're historical names like Venetian yeah. red as an example that was a pigment that came from Veneto region and uh, and and there's these deposits that are in the uh, not far from yeah there it is and not far from um, uh, from Veneta? the from the, well from Venice, mm -hmm. um, but but the but we did is we source a lot of these earth colors from northern Italy and and along the the coast uh, near Naples, and uh, so we try to name them accordingly to where a, a vicinity where they come from. So that was the that was the whole point of that. So uh, now I you tell it. us, so then you teaches, uh, you teach mostly on Mexico City. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Ah, yeah. In person, uh, my studio is in Mexico and, in, and it's part of a cultural <laughs> center, basically, a small cultural uh, community. Uh, we, we do different um, events. And part of it is also my workshops, which um, which are in a really wonderful place. Uh, it's a it's an old factory and it looks really great and it's really big. And now with COVID, it's really helpful to be doing workshops in such a big space. And for what concerns the the other courses, which are online, because uh, you know we need to get to most you know to a lot of people and share the knowledge uh, to to everybody uh, some of them are quite inexpensive and you know with a sort of a democratic price um, which is the domestica produced courses which which we have two courses on domestica and the other one the other formula is through zoom via zoom doing live uh, demonstrations and you know i try to create small courses of a month uh, each month we change the theme and you know this month is um it's actually i was painting a vicenza street view yesterday and uh and uh, venice is next uh tuesday and uh okay. you know whatever whatever makes us you know free to paint and meet together and have a good time <laughs> we're so separated you know yes so it's I like these groups to be small so that we can get to know each other. And the group is actually always a great, a great support for any course. Uh, really, the group makes the class. Uh, the, the group makes the course. Uh, I, I have done courses that are so you know, excellent, right? So, but mostly because of the group itself. Yeah, and so then. Uh our people can find your uh, courses on Domestica, yes? Is that correct? It's correct. And in my webpage, you actually get the link to the course, so it's much easier, uh, which is michelebayona.com. Uh, I don't know if you can put it down there. We but will. Honestly, we'll put that, uh, I'll put that information in the, uh, in the I'll chat. I'll put that in the comments. Yes. And, in the uh, comments. Yeah. That's, that's the easiest way, also because that way you help me more than Domestica. Otherwise, you help Domestica more than me. So <laughs> if you use my link, you help, you, you help a great deal. And um, those, those courses are, are a lot of fun. And actually, one is on watercolor and the other one is on drawing. And it's yes. about 
Leonardo da Vinci and, and his techniques, uh, part of it with some of your uh, material and you you will find as a student you will find a lot of Rublev material in the in the course itself you know when I explain how to prepare the paper and you know and uh, recently I've been using Ambrogio Yellow Earth my friend <laughs> okay. uh, on, a, on a drawing I, I want to show you okay. and this drawing which is uh, you know, studying Michelangelo, mm -hmm. we we're trying to get the right tone of the base of the paper. And honestly, we couldn't find it. And, and I was using ink. And then I decided, I don't know if you can see anything because the sun just got out. Uh, but basically, I just put some Ambrogio afterwards. And uh, it made the magic, you know. <laughs> the only sound it took, you know, it became alive. So we can, uh, as I said before, we can always use watercolor to adjust uh, a few general tones of our final products, even if we're using other tools such as um, charcoal or sanguine or you know those those trois crayon techniques um, can have a base and also can have a base afterwards. You yeah. can draw something on a, I would call it stupid, uh, white piece of paper. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we can use watercolor to make this paper become something else. And um, then you don't that need to, a... to buy the colored paper, yes? <laughs> you don't need to buy the colored paper. Actually, <laughs> I don't. It's so all, all uh, we have uh, we had the question about watercolor is grainy. So uh, just to answer that question, so we um, yes, uh, some of them absolutely are, and uh, due to the pigment particle size, and it's same like we have uh, in uh, oil colors uh, Rublev lines. So uh, we use exactly the same pigments in uh, watercolors, and so specifically our French colors having bigger particles so they the granulation is yep yep <laughs> the granulation is there and uh but some of them of course uh, they have smaller particles like if you will look like blue rich yellow ochre or prussian blue or ultramarine ultramarine can give a little bit but uh not much and so but uh it's um, uh, like Michele said, so every color is different and uh, it's, uh, it's, it will be learning curve because again, uh, the 20th century brought uh, to artists kind of like uh, uh, all colors overall, they behave the same. They, um, they obviously they look different because of the colors, but the behavior was the same. So because in most cases, uh, these days uh, uh, companies are using dyes. That's why your watercolors are there just like, you know, uh, floating and they are uh, running from you. Where the, uh, with uh, Rublev colors, a little bit different behavior and so, Rather, and, uh, rather than dyes, it's actually yes. very fine particles. Yes. So, and then which creates more staining. Yes, and, uh, on uh, on dyes, on, on on dyes. Yes. So what what? No, oh, you the, mean the, the, the pigments? Pigments. The pigments are so fine, yes. and yeah. and uh, and yeah. so they become they because of the very fine particle size, they tend to stain the paper more. They're a little more difficult to lift up. Not impossible, but of course Not it depends. Some. Depends on because if on it's the, bigger particles, the they yeah. picking uh, up very easy. Yeah. And well, we yeah. had a question. Also, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Also depends. But when you want to lift up a color, it, it really depends on the color itself. Yeah, you know, how much it stains. And yes, of course, the the gener like, you know the quality of pigments uh, has gone down the drain because you know pigments are produced for bigger um, for right. bigger business than art supplies so therefore cars and therefore like they are so much smaller and and i, I love how you uh, preserve the integrity of the pigments uh looking for the original ones uh you know i'm sure not it's, it's not easy but if it takes you to italy and the amalfi goes that's good too right yes <laughs> <laughs> you you lift the you lift the color much easier on a mm -hmm. cotton uh paper than on um, pulp cell cellulose paper, but you also need to uh, 
test the paper. But it is it a lot of watercolor is about the paper, honestly. So and yeah, in fact, that's a, that's a that's a question, Michele. Uh, which paper do you prefer? That's from our audience here. Well, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> and in in a bigger uh, video, Michele answered that question, but I would like you uh, address right now. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I do. Uh, me and George had a chat for like an hour. It was long. Yeah. <laughs> it was very... And thank you for your patience in uh, editing all that. Uh, I guess I guess I also got to know George much better. It's a very interesting <laughs> life. You, we should make an interview. I mean, now we should we should reverse part and make an interview. Yes. I'm going to interview George next yes. time. <laughs> and Tatiana. Uh, I will say, I will say any cotton paper will do the job. Some brands might be, uh, it, it's really so personal. Um, I guess somebody is asking me what paper do I use so that they think it's going to solve their problem. It's going to help if, in terms of what kind of paper, but the brand itself it doesn't really matter that much. Although I am in love with Arch paper, um, Arches is said in, in, in Spanish, uh, which is a paper from France and um, it's now, everything's been bought by Canson and Canson has been bought by Fila and, and you know, mm -hmm. but, but there's some, Waterford is really also an excellent paper. Uh, anything that is 300 grams, um, which is it? Uh, I think it's 14, right? Uh, and then uh, that has, uh, it, from that up, right? So it's, uh, it's thick and stable. Mm -hmm. And that has um, either a cold press or a rough, rough um, texture will do in terms of techniques uh, that are similar to the one I use. Uh, otherwise, you can use hot press, but actually I use hot press much more for drawings, right? So uh, drawings uh, will take hot press much better. Uh, with I think watercolor. you mentioned Stonehenge. Uh, Stonehenge. Stonehenge. Legion. See, of course, that's Legion. Yes. That's, Legion. Yeah. That's from Legion. You know, they're they're very nice, and mm -hmm. uh, that's also one I use. Um, I be, I was using that because when I went to New York to to shoot the video for for domestic, uh, uh -huh. Legion gave me a block. Uh, a watercolor block and it was really nice you know of them and i used it for for a month a month or so and yeah because i was much more into drawing at that time but we got all also the colored paper uh, by legion and you have products by legion too right yes yes, yes. yeah for the, for so the silver point uh, another question george i'll put this one about yes. um <clears throat> Someone wants to know, can you share what you feel is the advantage to making your own watercolors? For example, can you create your own mixtures this way? Yes, uh, I do that. And um, I have this little product here, which <laughs> helps, helps me a lot. You're a great advertiser, so we don't need to do that. <laughs> great, yes, yes. It's um, it's actually very balanced formula. That's why it works yeah. basically like it's you. It's foolproof. You can do whatever you want. You can make your own gouache if you want. Yeah, and also uh, it does vary because if I use two two pigments like these ones, they're quite similar, and and so the the amounts of and, and one is the raw sienna and the other one is burnt sienna. So. They're, they have very similar characteristics. They're like iron oxides. They come from Italy. They're basically ground. And and, and the amount of, uh, well, let's talk about the binder. The binder is Arabic gum and glycerin mostly, or more, you know, in older times, it was like, you know, honey, honey. sugar, I guess, with Benvy sure. George can, can be, That's what we use in 19th century uh, recipes. It's syrups. Uh -huh. Yeah, <clears throat> glycerin Perfect. was introduced into watercolors in about 1830. And before yeah, that, yeah. it was actually not even honey. It was 
uh, it was rock sugar. It was like crystallized sugar, and they would dissolve that into water. So that was actually even way a delicious, that. <laughs> a delicious binder. Yes, <laughs> very sweet. Uh, I mean, the percentage of pigment and binder may, may vary uh, depending on the pigment itself. And so it's about, ex you know, you need experience or you buy Rublev uh, in a pan or in a tube ready mixed. Um, one thing has to be uh, clear, you can get the grinder, actually Rublev sell a really wonderful like starting kit with the grinder and all that. But you can also, if you don't have it, you, you, don't, you don't find it for some reason, you can use your pigments. Just you need to separate them really well with a knife, really, really well. And then add some of this um, gamma rabe and see what happens. Um, I suggest you to try it because yeah. it's so really what fun I, to make your own. Yeah, if I could uh, just a little bit interrupt and so uh, in the uh, laurel, yeah, so then the... I think the advantage is so like, for example, in our line, we have uh, right now we were working and that's uh, we are working for new. Um, where is the camera? OK, here we are working on new um, website and now we are making all wow. new swatches for the Yeah, it's last four, six months. So but um, so we are new, making new swatches and we figure out. So then in tubes, we have 45. Uh, pigment uh, colors right now uh, it's uh, so we, then we have probably like around 16 just in pants and we will talk about why in pants so but overall it's basically still limited um, number of when you go to other companies you can see like 202 uh, different colors so but we do have more than 200 uh, pigments so here's your advantage. If we uh, we don't make the color what you specifically want, and uh, so what you can do, you can just it's very inexpensive. The the uh, the medium what uh, Michele was showing, it's a watercolor medium, and you can buy the smallest amount of the pigment, and see how that pigment will specifically work for your uh, for your advantages or not, and so then. And uh, since we, again, we, we sell everything in very small amounts, so then uh, it will be very inexpensive way to try. And, uh, and of course, yeah. every pigment behave different. That's why in, in our tubes, uh, like literally every color behaves different. So, uh, so if we are going back to pants, so I can tell you this, uh, because most of this uh, pants colors, it's the, it's historical colors. They never, um, you know, they never supposed to be in the tubes. They were uh, ground and made in uh, shells. That's why we are making shells too. And um, so in order to put that in, in tubes, so that means we need to suspend the pigment uh, in, the bind, uh, in the binder. And so therefore some of them don't behave very well. And uh, it will be understandable if, if our colors will be used only by professionals. And uh, so it would be nice. But at the same time, we do understand that we are for, you know, for everybody. And so then people who will just start to work with watercolors and then they see like or separation or they, or they see then uh, weird behavior of one or another colors, then they're like, oh, uh, something is wrong with this color. And so then they, they can completely freak out. So that's why we are doing on pens, which, by the way, uh, the question to you, Michele, because I, uh, since I'm from Russia, so then I remember that every professional artist mostly were painting that time in uh, from pens. And that's what I hear in, in Europe, mostly people using in pens the uh, tubes are coming just like to buy the tube and squeeze to the to the um, pan and work from that yes yeah but yes. I, every time like when when we are ha we have classes every time saying then pens actually much more economical what i think because what we do we are well, of course we need to do everything different from everybody else so then we 
put in the two the pens uh, several times when it's you know we put it it shrink it uh, and so we pour again and it shrinks again and it's why all our colors like look like funny you know but at the same time you just buying basically concentrated color where in the tube you still buy with the water but same time i understand that these days people uh make even watercolors becoming bigger yes and so that's why it does make sense to like squeeze from the tube because it's already ready color and so then is it, i mean there's a certain dose of frustration trying to get a, to activate a pen yeah and uh, i guess it's very zen you need to open your pens and and um just prepare them half an hour before you start drawing and with the tube if you're in a rush and you want a creamy color yes. ready you you just get it off the tube then it stays in the pan and um you know again this is really messy you know but <laughs> love it but it, but it is what it is you know yeah this is a pan oh, yeah yep this, yep. this is a right? pan and it's actually cobalt blue and uh, has to be in a pen because you explain look you explain you explain to me that the tube you know doesn't really want to go into a tube yeah um Aureline yellow is also Aureline, yep is also yep. a pen because of the color thank you and other colors are really just creams that you know you creamy a creamy color ready to use and especially if you paint big as i said in the video you need to use tubes because it's so much easier and you yeah. can make it you can create a Convenient. great qu quantity of color yeah. have it in your pens like even on bigger surfaces and then use them um, but yes if you have a travel kit it's so much easier to just use pens and you don't need to carry the tubes with you or you just prepare with the tubes beforehand and when they're when they're dry you just yeah. Also with the tubes is the same. When it dries, it reduces in, in volume and you, you add more. But honestly, the, what you suggest is to make your own, which is sort of, uh, I'm not the brand strategist here, but you know, <laughs> buy Rublev color. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, guess, I guess the question though is um, really, is there an advantage what Laurel was asking, mm -hmm. is there an advantage from your standpoint, from an artist standpoint, of making your own watercolors? Because we do see a lot of people uh, recently making their own watercolors. It's it's really amazing, actually. COVID just, uh, uh, COVID just changed everything. Uh, what You cannot believe how many watercolor paint making sets we sold in one year yeah. of uh, 2020. It, yeah. it was amazing. I, I was just like, what, what change our perspective to watercolors. It looks like you're going to sell more after this. Interview. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I will suggest to try because it's a lot of fun and you feel proud about your own color and you feel really proud. You want to use it all the time. You know, I do have some pre-mixed uh, made by myself with the pigment and they're in my pan. And I always want to use those uh, for some reason. You know, I go through those. Uh, recently, I did some raw sienna. It was it was really nice, and you know, it's never as good as what Tatiana and George will create for you, because it's so much better. But you made it, and so you feel good about it. Uh, and I guess art is about that. It's about having fun. No, I, I, yeah, I truly you know, believe experiment. this. Yeah. And you can experiment, Tatiana, with with a. Uh, you, I know you paint and you both paint and when when you experiment with something as you said you know when I invite a, an artist it's always different a different presentation that what I will make because I will be either too specific or suggest you know 20 colors and the artist comes and says you know I only use three <laughs> um, stuff like that so I would say having fun with art and art materials is the best and buying art materials for every artist or art lover is is a sort of an orgasmic uh, beep That's true. experience. That's true. <laughs> it's true. And um, so I'm really glad that um, 
I can buy from you. You, you are a family. You you have your own small business, and uh, you know I'd rather I'd rather be with always rather buy from natural pigments, Rublev uh, <laughs> colors, rather than Winsor and Newton. Although I love Winsor and Newton, but you know because if there's a color I like and you know you make it, I, I'll buy it from you. That's as simple as that. Okay. There's another question here. Yeah. Um, McKinley is um, uh, in in the long version of the video. We talk about preparing uh, the the support for receiving paint, uh, and but you also mentioned in there. But perhaps we can mention this uh, when you apply watercolor over a drawing. Uh, Laurel says, "I assume that you fix the drawing first, or do you just apply the watercolor and see what happens?" Yeah, well, I wouldn't do it on a finished drawings that you really like um, as, as a first exper experiment or attempt. I will just get a, a, a small drawing you don't care about. And with the same technique and material, try on that first and see how it works. Because a lot of it is to balance the charge of the brush. And once the charge is correct, meaning the right amount of water and pigment in your brush, you might be able to um, apply this layer of color without disrupting anything underneath. In a, in a way, that's why I was pulling up this drawing. In a way, what you could do is to, especially if there's some, some gin, you know, some red chalk, and black chalk, you know, those can slightly melt and merge together, which will actually make it look much more pictorial and uh, it's even better. Then afterwards, whatever has been toned down by the layer of water, um, for some reason, um, you can fix it because you are the artist who made it. I mean, I wouldn't do it on somebody else's work. Of course, I would never do that. You know, <laughs> I will fix it first and then eventually put some whatever you need to put on top of it. But um, you can never remove anything that is made on paper. So basically, I will suggest do it on your own work and uh, try on a small drawing that you don't care about much first and then give it a try. Because, you know, I just gave it a try and it worked. And I was so happy about that, you know, with. Red but you do in both, yes. But no. but the the, qu the question really comes down to uh, you don't fix it first. You don't put a uh, spray no, of fix it. He's in. not, but because uh, obviously that would change the surface. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I never use any fixative e mm -hmm. ever on paper. Mm. But you do in both, and so you do in watercolors first, and then drawing afterwards too. Yes. Yeah. No. Obviously. Yeah. I, I recommend to prepare the paper first and then draw on top of it. Yeah. And that will that will allow you to use whites and uh, you know get yeah. highlights mm -hmm. and have a like say medium tonal value so you only work on darks and lights such as the Renaissance uh, period. But you can also get an older drawing as as you were asking. You can get an older drawing and give give to this drawing a, a, a general tone on top of it. And of course, you need the same to, to have the same materials of the drawing you made, just in case some of these parts of the drawing, Almost. you know, sometimes they kind of like, you know, some of the pigment can go off and you just fix it. You just make it like darker somehow, and minimal, a minimal amount of work on top of it. Actually, it creates the opportunity to do some more hatching. Uh, with watercolor as well, I do that. If I have a watercolor that I've done before and it needs to be revived somehow, it needs like, you know, more goldy color uh, on top of it. And sometimes when you take a picture of it, you realize that, you know, your watercolor is missing some of the, the warm tones or some cold tones. Um, you can just add this chroma with a new pigment uh, on top of it uh, with a fine layer of, of watercolor. 
Um, so I always let it rest a day or two and then do that. Right. So we uh, looks like we done and um, Michele, I'm so happy finally that interview happened and so we didn't expect that much advertising but it's lovely I love that <laughs> and so and oh thank you Ri Ri you are my rock like always so yes thank you very much <laughs> so so um, I hope we will uh, work more with you and so maybe we will bring you uh, in the future and so something is flying here that's why <laughs> so and uh, thank you Michele and uh, please um, remember we have Michele's um, uh, page on our uh, website so where you can see all his colors what he likes in our uh, line of colors yeah definitely and, visit his website and, and you can see his uh instructions and uh, courses and see some of his work and so of really course um, uh, very inexpensive um, uh, course courses but great courses in domestica i so i highly suggest in this so thank you very much don't forget we have 20 percent discount until july 4th on all travel sets uh, it's um, a special deal just for people who uh, watch us on uh, online and i'll put the link at, in the yes. comments uh, where to get the travel sets. Thank you, Michele. Thank you, Michele. Thank you. It's, a, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Viva l'arte. Viva l'arte. <laughs>